Hey everyone, thanks for joining uh, to AHA, uh -huh, a refactoring story. I'm Gopala Sakshindalam, a senior software engineer at Salesforce, my Twitter handle and website. Uh, feel free to reach me out if you have any doubts. And uh, let's start with what's refactoring. So most of us might think refactoring is just like restructuring code from uh, one place to another and then just moving lines around with ID shortcuts. But let's ask the definition from the person who wrote an entire book about it. And as for him, refactoring is altering the internal structure without changing the external behavior. And to me, it this uh, doesn't apply to entire application, but also applies to each and every component which makes up that application. That brings me to the story of the stock is as a dev, I need to refactor to make my code base refactorable. So I want to leave my code base as a refactor in a state uh, so that it can be refactorable going forward. And that is just an agile way of saying, hey, I want to build my components like Lego pieces. Why Lego pieces? Lego pieces are the ones which can be reused and replaced and most importantly composed together to form different structures. So that's refactorability for me. And how can we do that? So now that we sort of understood what is refactorability, we need to go and pitch this to a manager for funding. Of course, we all are busy building features. Nobody sort of gives you funding for refactoring. But you got to have a trick. you got to speak in their own language. And this is what worked for me. So I went ahead with these three things and then explained him what methods am I focusing on, what obstacles my code base has, and what metrics will I use to measure what I have just done. And Methods, we're going to just focus on a couple of them, but then these two methods are going to bring a lot of difference in our code base. First is human readability. We're going to focus on readability because refactoring is for humans. Uh, okay, uh, Machines can run any shitty code. And component isolation that uh, we just discussed, uh, that our components will isolate our components so they can be used, reused, and composed. Then obstacles, some obstacles that my code base has, uh, has like exceptions. The code base sort of filled with exceptions, and we'll see how exceptions can form entanglement between components who are difficult to move around. And mutability, which is even unholy, and how it can invisibly create a lot of entanglements. And some metrics, uh, cognitive complexity is a metric which is inversely proportional to readability, and testability is another which sort of uh, mirrors uh, how, how componentized your application is. So you can, you should be able to test things in isolation. That said, I hope you are all clear with this big picture of our talk. Let's move ahead, start with our obstacles. The first one, exceptions. So how are exceptions bad? Uh, let me start with this. Whenever you sort of read your own code or uh, you know someone else's code, you always have two IDs running. The one which runs on laptop, it sort of takes its sweet time to index and gobbles up a lot of RAM, and it's so powerful. And with the other one, it's not so powerful, the one which runs in skull. Slowly, these line by line try to make sure what's going on on the ID canvas. And if you have AD history on top of it, like me, like never use exceptions because they can sort of throw your execution suddenly all of a sudden to some other place uh, which you sort of won't expect. So I, as you know, exceptions are called modern go-tos and they're the most abused language feature. Why? Because you can sort of catch anything, rethrow anything that is just uh, and everything is possible, and there is no point of even having exceptions. And one of the reasons why modern languages like Kotlin are moving away from this exception model. So, but uh, in our particular talk, in this context, exceptions hurt composability. Let's see how that point can be proved. Imagine this particular innocent function, but then this throws an exception. Now, this is bound to the caller. A uh, caller has to sort of handle this exception. And if caller is notorious, he can even throw that exception at the top. So this function is sort of bound to the entire call stack. And as it throws an exception, you never know where it ends up. So, but then why does it need to throw an exception? The problem here is this exception is sort of, uh, this uh, method is sort of trying to communicate, hey, there is some problem. But it doesn't know how to communicate when there is no problem. Ideally, it should have used optional, which represents an effect of absence. And when there is no problem, it can happily return an option dot empty. That brings me to a point wherein you can replace all your exceptions with ADTs. ADT stands for algebraic data types. Uh, they're not as scary as they're named after, as simple as optional that we just saw, which should present some or none. And there is also something called tuple, which comes from VR VR library. It's a great, awesome library you should go explore, which is like a pair, one with another. And either, it's like a left or right. Uh, consider either like, it like an enum, 
wherein it can either be left or right. And left or right are like containers which sort of store some values. So we can use this model to represent, hey, when something is wrong, my convention is I'll put it on the left. And if everything is right, I'll put the value on the right. So this is how uh, we can use either. For example, exceptions are also used to misuse to return multiple data types when there is a scenario wherein this function, when everything is right, it sort of sends an integer back. But if there is something wrong, it, it uses an exception because it doesn't know how to return that data type. But if you use an either, you can happily return two different data types like this, wherein if everything is wrong, I put things in right, and if something is wrong, it's on the left. We'll see how we can extensively use it going forward. But now, just throw away exceptions from your code base. Then that comes to the next obstacle, mutable state. Uh, I mean, uh, shared mutable state. Uh -huh. It's shared mutable state on a shared code base. That's pretty lengthy and scary as well. So my point is mutable objects as input params, couple components. But let's see with an example. Uh, so this in, in essence, some function, all it does is takes a list and prepares uh, some of all the numbers in the list. That's it, no tricking. Uh, but then somebody one day wanted to extend the sum, so he wrote something called sum absolute. Uh, so he sort of inverted the neg negations of all the numbers, made them positives, and reused the sum in the end. So everybody's happy. Client uses sum absolute. It's perfectly working for him. We all went for GA party, and great. So again, after some time, somebody added this one line, and he got this unholy result. So this might be a simple example. I just want you to magnify that such things, what happens in production. And uh, in production, he has to do a very painful debugging session to understand he just got bitten by a latent bug. And the latent bug is because some absolute got a reference of a mutable data structure, and he took that as a license to do anything on it. And I, I in my book, it's not a problem with some absolute. It's a problem with the client who is sending him a reference of a mutable data structure and expecting nobody should tinker it. But he tinkered, just some absolute tinkered it. And then now what ended up happening is we, we just can't reuse the data structure anymore. And now the client and some absolute and some are intertwined because of this mutable data structure passing around of it. So uh, that brings me to a point that mutable DS as input params is unholy for isolation. Never ever use mutable DS. But what about written types? If I you if I return mutable objects, uh, will I still have the same problem? you'll have a bigger problem. Let me explain with this simple example. Let us say you have uh, this simple function, which is used to uh, return the laying date of an egg based on an ID, a mock code. And uh, it is a heavy operation. And it has two dependent components. Imagine these two are independent components in two different modules. One guy takes this date, checks it with before 15, and then returns true or false. Another one takes a diff from today's date and calculates age. Now. One day, this guy who has first written get legging date thinks that he should improve his performance, is doing redundant queries for the same IDs, and then he went goes ahead and implements this query, uh, sorry, caching. Now, even everything is working fine, his performance improved, people are happy. And another day, this component one who is uh, who wanted to log something, so unaware of where his laying date coming from, and because he's not using this laying date anywhere after it. He thought, hey, let me reuse this laying date to print the dates month and year uh, and just have to print 15 instead of the date. So he mutated that laying date and printed laying date should be before 15th of that month and year. Now, this guy just have no clue that he is mutating something which is all which is cached and being reused by some other component. This innocent component got affected, although it does, didn't do anything. And this is very. Uh, Generally, this happens a lot in our code bases, right? We sort of fix something and something else breaks somewhere else. And a lot of our debugging sessions end up where we sort of have debug points to understand why the state of the object is like this. So if you use, uh, if you return mutable data structures, this can happen all the time. This is quantum entanglement for me, like an invisible entanglement between two components. So never let that happen. And another culprit in this uh, play is, also pointers. It points everywhere in Java, right? Uh, I myself got bitten, and I keep referring back to this question. Looking at the bookmarks and upwards, I'm pretty sure a lot of developers got bitten by this bug. And But you can argue, hey, I said mutability is a problem. But I see most of the Java programs 
are written using mutable data structures. Why is that? It's because mutability, unfortunately, is the default mode in Java. And we all know how powerful defaults are. And you must have heard about this uh, uh, Google Apple deal where Google pays a hefty check every year just to have the search engine as default on iOS devices on Safari or something. So people sort of seldom go away from defaults and sort of fall in that mode. I would say make immutability your default. And uh, as just like anything in life, uh, like Discipline to beat default, you need discipline. So just like how we work out every day and how we have to follow traffic rules. So in order to keep things in order. So some quick wins uh, are like you make a habit of using final before wars and function params to guard your differences and follow this immutable strategy to make all your photos immutable. And but believe me, it's not easy. You can also sort of uh, depend on some third party libraries like Lumbach, uh, Google Auto and Immutables. But it takes a lot of effort for sure. So that's why you, got, you also get to encounter some anti-immutables. They say, why do I need immutability if it's uh, just single-threaded? Unless it's multi-threaded, I wouldn't use immutability. So I that brings me to the same analogy. Be your app be single-threaded or multi-threaded, your brain is by default concurrent, isn't it, with all the distractions happening. By the way, this is my kid crying. And as a new parent, I can watch how difficult it is to do child care as well as coding at the same time being at home. So that said, uh, if everything is immutable, what's my code supposed to do? That's what. Uh, uh, that's a big question, right? Code is supposed to do something on the state. So if you have a mutable list, which that would invite uh, imperative mutation like this. But then if you replaced uh, your mutable list with an immutable list, uh, you are not left without any choice but to use this transformation instead of mutation. What is transformation? It's just uh, taking one list and transforming the uh, objects in it and preparing a new list rather than tinkering that one list. So mutability and imperativity are like friends. One likes to live with another. But immutability and transformation are like couples. They have to live together. There is no other choice. So immutability forces this transformation. Now I don't have to tell you who is the wife and who is the husband, right? So as long as you're using immutability, you don't have a choice. Uh, the moment you try to mutate it, you get a exception right in front of your face. Awesome. So there's an immutability effect perf. This is a big argument that people make. But uh, I'm control V, control C, control C, control V from the Oracle documentation that impact of object creation is often overestimated. It can be offset by decreased overhead due to garbage collection, period. You can explore more from the link. Uh, and, and Java is also making doing its part to induce immutability into, into the language. And as you know, the most used data type string is immutable. Java it replaced uh, date with immutable local date. Java 11 introduced immutable collections. And 16 has this consist operated to list for unmodifiable list uh, to get unmodifiable list directly from the string. Let's try to implement something that we just discussed in a real world application, but we'll see how big of an impact it can create, how, how it changes the face of the application. So this is a sample application of the day. Uh, think of it as some uh, batch API, which takes a list of JSONs, which gets marshaled into POJOs. And then we have some intermediate steps where we sort of filter out uh, bad ones and then let the good ones move ahead. So something like this. And and we need to handle this partial failures because uh, when it comes to bash api you can't right away send back error response as and when we found as and when we find bad objects so at every layer you might find new bad objects so the thing is you have to hold on to them somehow keep them get, from getting processed in further layers and then return back an aggregated response towards the end so we might probably the first thought that comes to our mind is uh, use a temporary data structure like hash map and put all the bad ones into it and keep uh, collecting them as we go. And then towards the end, use that hash map to sort of prepare an aggregated response. And this is how the code might look like, where you have a failure map going into each and every function, like filters, validate, et cetera. And then it sort of, it sort of drives the logic wherein if something is in the failure map, you sort of skip that. And that happens through partition like this between each and every function. So wherein uh, you have a failure map, and then you take something like non-duplicate eggs and other immutable data structure, and then 
you sort of look through all your eggs and then check if it's part of failure map or not and then prepare a non duplicate eggs and then compete ahead with valid into validations right so that end make ends up uh, looking like this wherein you have intermediate steps intermediate partitions and then lot of mutability and try catching uh, etc now let's let's see how as you all as you all already understood this code is sort of having all those problems that we discussed it has mutable data structures being exchanged it has exceptions being thrown how can we improve it so we refactored that into this so let us understand the signature shift we have brought uh, so this uh, particular function filter duplicates now is no more taking failure map but rather it it takes uh, the list of x and then returns back a list of others now this is how it looks like the return from filters uh, so return a list of others look like so as we discussed it's like container to having two containers left and right and if left is filled right is not filled and vice versa and uh, all the bad ones will be on the left and that's how the caller of the function can understand hey this is bad when i should skip them from processing and the good news is that happens automatically because either is a monad i'm not going to get into that pattern uh, now because i have an entire tech talk about it you can go and refer but then simply saying if you go and uh, have the sort of plumbing and do certain validations on either this is inside validate function all of these validations won't happen if either is on the left so this is a tech talk which talks about it it's a one hour long tech talk you can go and please refer uh, so it sort of fills the missing gap that you have might have in this talk and so this is how we isolated uh, so we sort of refactored our pieces into isolated components as you can see now each and every function is independent and doesn't know what is happening outside of its scope and there is no mutable data structures that's passing around and we have re also replaced these exceptions with uh, either as we discussed before now that sort of uh, makes me feel makes me think of this as math derivation if you are like a fan of math uh, subject so uh, this is because uh, the output of a function happens to be input for another and so that's how they fit fit like lego pieces but let's see how we can fit them together now this is as simple as that because this is possible only because they are like mass derivation or the lego pieces where interfaces fit fit to each other so uh, once you get a stream of aethers you can pump them and uh, run this validate function on each and every aether and we just saw that if aether is on the left this validate function just gets skipped for them and that's how we sort of go ahead and in the end just partition based on right and left and take all the writes put them into the vp and based on uh, whatever response you get you can send back a response as simple as that now let's see how are we go doing on the goal let's ask our metrics so our metric one is cognitive complexity this code for me is cognitively complex because uh, the components are bound to each other and there's some mutable data structures go uh, that are going into functions coming out of functions a lot of partitioning happening in between and a lot of try catching as well and as we discussed this also has some latent bugs it might have uh, might be a place for latent bugs and it's difficult to even extend this code uh, if you want to add more steps in between but this code to me even not without looking at the metrics is cognitively a le lot less complex and easy on reading that's it uh, this is when subjectively seen i still uh, see i mean encounter people who feel this is complex and complexity is something we sort of throw around uh, loosely without understanding what exactly is complex so there are different types to complexity like accidental complexity essential complexity cognitive or psychomotor complexity and even different layers to it like unfamiliarity versus unreadability strict versus non extensible etc so in this particular uh, uh, particular code what is complexity it can be essential complexity because we sort of uh, uh, have a lot of filters and a lot of processing that we're doing and uh, it can also be unfamiliarity probably somebody who did not get a chance to work on java 8 or something uh, uh, sort of he that didn't hear about either or something so it's always possible and as long as he got to understand them all of this makes sense just like any foreign language that we learn and strictness this is something we sort of induced intentionally as we discussed uh, this code just doesn't let you do anything just like the mutable code uh, let, lets you do like wherein you can twist and turn the state of 
any object. It's not as free as that. This is like going in lanes. Now the operators are in control, and you as a developer just got to provide inputs to it. So that is the reason it might feel like I'm coding, coding with handcuffs if you're not used to the style of programming. That said, this is for good. And even uh, if anybody who wants to extend this or build something above it, you already have those lanes in which he has to follow. So he can't sort of take shortcuts and break rules. Awesome. And if you really want to objectively measure a cognitive complexity, there are great tools like Sonar Cube. And I have an entire talk on how you can use this to measure and compare cognitive complexity. I request you to please go back and report. And our next metric, testability. If you have done all of that we discussed, you get testability for free. But then I also have a couple more tips, especially if you're working in legacy systems where a uh, few things which are not in your control. Uh, I'll give you a few tips for how you can boost your testability. First one being uh, fill entity objects. Imagine entity, entity is some a legacy object which you can't instantiate in a JUnit context or else uh, in your application context, and you get it from somewhere. And you, let us say, have to fill it with all the fields that are from the egg, uh, all the non null fields. So, this simple function, although this looks simple, uh, this has a problem uh, wherein, because in JUnit context, I can't instantiate an egg. I can't test this function right away without mocking it. And it has multiple if else if conditions. And I have to uh, test, write tests for each and every branch. So I might end up writing tests like this, wherein I use verify calls to understand whether a particular call has been happening. And this for me is a brittle test because this breaks every time you add new field or it is also asking for internal information, what is happening inside your unit. That's a big red mark. Because unit test should not ask for internals. Unit testing is not testing internals. It's uh, it's like end-to-end -end test for your unit. It should be like an idiotic bot which just fires uh, your function, gets the data back, and asserts on it. So that brings me to the point: you should separate static from signal. What do I mean by that? Static is like uh, in this particular example, the one-to-one -one field mapping between eggs, and signal is how you actually fill, like using all the foot and etc. So looking at the same example, this is how you can refactor that into separate static information. The field mappings like can be a static data, which you probably don't need tests for. And then the algorithm which fills, uh, again, this is a simple example. Uh, so the algorithm can take a by consumer like this, which sort of is used as a filler to fill the fields from egg to egg entity. And all it cares is it doesn't uh, know who whom it is filling it to as long as I'm getting a function, I'm using that function to just call it and fill whatever it is asking me to fill. And this is how you can call it. So this particular function uses identity put, and this put will be called here. And this function algorithm doesn't know what is what is it filling into. Now, because of that, you can easily test this function in this way. See, I'm using a hash map instead of identity. Now, this, uh, that algorithm doesn't care if it's hashmap.put or identity.put, as long as the by consumer which takes two strings. This works. Now, this test can, is no more brittle, and it doesn't fail every time I sort of uh, add more new fields, et cetera. So that's how you can sort of hit, uh, uh, hit your functions, which are sort of dependent on legacy objects. Another one, DI, and uh, we all know like uh, dependency injection is something we need to inject all our side effect objects to constructors so we can mock them uh, in the code, in the mocking code. But the better part is don't try to inject your entire object if you're just dependent on one function. So you can instead inject a function like this, uh, wherein you're only, let us say, dependent on insert function, inject it as a function. So this is ports and adapters architecture, of course, without any extra interfaces. This is how the bean for that uh, insert function looks like. You can happily uh, stub it in your functions without actually mocking the entire egg repo. That said, uh, my point is always testability should come first. And test coverage is just a metric uh, which indicates it. But we can always have 100% test coverage without your code actually being testable. So never ever let that happen. Always uh, focus on testability. And tests should be easy to do so that test coverage organically improves. And tests should not be an afterthought. Uh, tests should always happen together as you refactor. And uh, there should be like a ping pong uh, cycle as you have already uh, must have read about TDD.
So in the end, entropy is inevitable. No matter what we do, as people jump in, add more features, entropy of the code base increases. But all we're trying to do is the rate of increase should not be exponential or linear. Rather than it should be logarithmic. So that's what our aim is. So over a time, it just doesn't go out of our hands. We can sort of again do our exercise to keep in check. But then don't ever do this. Like let just go ahead and refactor half your code base, especially if you don't have tests. Because you might end up in a situation like this. I intentionally left the last quadrant empty to leave it for your imagination or what all can happen if you refactor without tests. So always refactor incrementally as prescribed by TDD. Uh, always have a test to back up your logic, and then you can go ahead and improve it uh, incrementally rather than doing it all of uh, all of all together. And let me end this talk with this great quote from Clean Code Book uh, that. Even bad code can function, but if code isn't clean, it can bring a development organization to its knees. Please never let that happen. You can find the slides here and the code here. Always uh, feel free to reach me, reach out to me if you have any doubts. And thanks a lot for attending.